start a new trend. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for attending tonight's meeting of the Westerville City Schools Board of Education. The agenda will be displayed on the screens in the front of the room. You may also follow along by connecting to the district's website, www.wcsoh.org. Uh, click on our district link and then select Board of Education, then the Board Docs agenda, and then select tonight's meeting. There will be two opportunities to address the board this evening, the first being agenda item 6.01. The first set of public comments is relative to agenda items 7.01 through 11.04. Please state the items that you're referencing at the beginning of your comments. The second opportunity is agenda item 12.01, and there's a sign-up sheet located on a table in the back of the room if you would like to speak. Each speaker will have five minutes to address the board, and then um, there will be a timer shown on the screen. And with that, Ms. Hendricks, will you please call the roll? Mr. Bird. Here. Mr. Ferlardo. Here. Dr. Nestor Baker. Here. Mrs. Davidson. Here. Ms. Cotter. Here. If everyone would like to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, our first uh, main agenda item is the retirement recognitions. I would like to recognize Mr. Villardo. Thank you, President Cotter. This is uh, this is uh, just a, a joyful occasion for us, but uh, admittedly, it's, it, it's a little bit bittersweet. We uh, say goodbye to people that have done um, tremendous work in the district and given us many years, in some cases many, many years, uh, but we are just really excited for the next chapter. Let me read something to you, uh, just a moment, and then I will go to the podium, ask the board uh, uh, administration to come up front here. Then I'm going to ask each one of you to come up to me and I'm going to introduce you individually, but I'd first like to just share with you that uh, collectively we would like to say congratulations. The Westerville City School District is losing 170 years of combined experience in the licensed and classified staff that are leaving us today. Regardless of where this phase of your life's journey takes you, please know how proud we are of the work that you have done, that you have accomplished during your time here. Your legacy is what you have put into the lives of the other adults that you've worked with and the students that you've cared for. Your legacy will be treasured for many years to come as the students whose lives you've touched and have guided become successful adults. In addition, as you will see in just a moment, you have touched the lives of your peers. And that is not something to be taken lightly. Seeing the results of your work firsthand provides us with an optimistic outlook on the state of our schools, the state of our community. I would suggest the state of our country because you have touched the life of a child and you have taught our future leaders well. From the board, from the administration, we wish you a long, healthy, and joy-filled retirement. I'm going to go to the podium, ask the board, uh, Mr. Hershiser, and Laura, you get to go up too. <laughs> uh, this year's retirees will be honored much like we do at graduation. For the last several months, the superintendent's office has been dis collecting descriptive words of you from your peers. That in itself should have most of you running, I would think. Uh, which we have been, put, which have been put into a keepsake that you will get in just a minute. 
each retiree in, in, in attendance, I'm going to ask you to come forward to stand here to face the Congre um <laughs> face these people <laughs> as I share words with you that your co-workers uh, say best describe you. Then you'll proceed down the uh, receiving line and receive some uh, keepsakes. Um, Gail Walter, would Gail please come forward? You can tell how all the retirees just love standing here next to me. So Gail, if you'll face them. Gail is from the Early Learning Center, and the three words that best describe her, according to her peers, are knowledgeable, cultured, and a traveler. So please help me congratulate Gail. One more time, thank Gail, please. Uh, Joseph Carr. Joseph comes to us from St. Paul School, and the three words that best describe him, according to his peers, kind-hearted, adventurous, and one of a kind. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph, one more time. From Custodial Services, Ken Ballinger. Uh, Ken, as I said, from, comes from Custodial Services. And the last building you worked in was? Faust Elementary. Faust Elementary is head custodian for about 10? About, about eight years. About eight years. His uh, partners recognize him as genuine, intelligent, and a communicator. I, I did. We did it. <laughs> Congratulations to Ken. Go on up. Thank Ken again for me. Craig Eberhard. Craig, also from Custodial Services, uh, is recognized as dependable, a veteran, and hard working. Please thank Craig. Let's thank Craig one more time. And Charlotte Hinsman. I just talked to Charlotte a few moments ago in the break room and um, Charlotte told me that she, uh, before she was a bus driver, was a semi-driver, right? Semi-trucks. 
So I said, because I just say things sometimes, I said, so which was harder, <laughs> driving all the children on the bus <laughs> or the semi-loads? And she quickly responded, the semi-loads don't talk back to you. So... <laughs> Very nice, very nice, thank you. Uh, Charlotte, uh, Transportation Services is uh, by her peers, named as a hard worker, a trainer, and passionate. Help us thank Charlotte. Thank Charlotte one more time. I, I am just the one that uh, gets to speak the words, but I guarantee you that from the board and from the administration, uh, we take very seriously and very deeply uh, the, the, the passion with which you have done your jobs uh, for, for many years. You, you have impacted lives. N never, never forget that. And so on behalf of the board, the administration, uh, I just, uh, w we love taking the time to do this and would all of you just one more time thank all of our retirees. And I think uh, there will be some pictures out in the hallway for those of you, and unless you want to stay for the rest of the board meeting. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> there will be some pictures out front. Thank you. Okay, our next agenda item is 4.01. Um, we do not generally do a motion to approve the minutes, but they are uh, minutes for May 7th, regular session, and the executive session is held on May 10th. Are there any comments from the board about those minutes? Okay, um, then we'll go ahead and move forward. Our next part of the agenda is 6.01, public comments, and it doesn't look like anyone has signed up for that opportunity to speak. Moving on to item number 7.01, um, can I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Ms. Hendricks, would you like to discuss that item? So tonight we're bringing the April financials forward for your uh, review and approval. Um, as of April 30th, our year-to-date receipts in the general fund were $165,047,000. Year-to-date expenditures, $138,323,000. An unencumbered balance of $116,201,000. All funds, year-to-date receipts, $212,538,000. Year-to-date expenditures, $183,291,000, and an unencumbered fund balance for all funds of $135,396,000. Any questions? Can you please call the roll? Mr. Villardo. Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes. Mr. Bird. Yes. Mrs. Davidson. Yes. Ms. Cotter. Okay. Can I also have a motion and a second for item 7.02, the resolution to approve the updated five-year forecast for fiscal year 2018 through fiscal year 2022? So moved. Second. Ms. Hendricks? I'll go to the Madam 
President, members of the board, I am here tonight to present you with an updated five-year forecast. The purpose of this forecast is to provide a standardized tool for long-range planning to serve as a basis for the district's ability to sign the 412 certificate and to provide ODE and the Outer States Office a method to identify districts headed toward financial difficulties. The forecast is required to be filed each October and May. I know those numbers are very small, <laughs> but here is our updated forecast um, as of May. Um, the district has performed better than the October forecast in revenues and expenditures for FY18. Revenues are exceeding expenditures by 16.4 million for FY18, which is 7.7 .7 million improvement from October. So let's take a look at each individual line so you can see that a little better. General property real estate is budgeted at, um, oh, where's my sheet? At 108,500,000. Um, and then of, of the property tax, almost 60% of the district's revenue is generated from real estate property taxes. Reappraisal occurred in 2017 values for tax revenue for 2018 and substantial growth was realized. Residential property values grew by $214 million. However, property value growth does not generate Cummins rent property tax revenue. This is due to House Bill 920, whereby tax rates are rolled back to virtually eliminate any impact of increased in values. While voters approved a substitute renewal of the emergency levy in 2016 that allows growth from new construction from that point on, we believe that the majority of this increase is due to changes in the federal tax laws that are limiting the amount of deductibility of property, state, and local income taxes. There's anecdotal evidence that taxpayers had the, that had the cash prepaid their entire 2018 tax bill before January 1, 2018 to take credit on their 2017 taxes. The true impact of this will become clearer as we receive the second half set settlement in the fall. This is reflected in decreased projections for 2019 and then you'll see the growth continue thereafter. Personal property tax allocation and personal utility, pub, uh, public utility, personal property tax. So personal utility is budgeted for 3.5 million and property tax allocation is now forecasted at 14 million. Uh, slight change in both of those, nothing significant. Public utility uh, revenue, that category is about 1.8% of the district revenue. The increase is basically as businesses invest in the utility infrastructure and it's projected to grow about 2.5% over the next uh, five years. Property tax allocation, that account or that line item is for the state reimbursement of local taxes known as homestead and rollback. Uh, the reimbursement is based on real estate revenue and the projected trend parallels the residential real estate revenue. State foundation is unrestricted and restricted, two line items. The restricted line item is budgeted at 44.3 million now in the forecast and the unrestricted or the restricted is now at 1.2 million. Um, state unrestricted didn't change very much. The restricted increased a little bit and we'll talk about that. So the unrestricted grants and aids are the Ohio's per pupil funding. The district is a cap district, which means that our calculated per pupil funding is more than a state allows to flow to the district. Um, our unfunded formula for this year, FY18, was $11.8 million. The forecast is modeling a 3% gain cap that's currently in the state budget for 18 and 19, and then 2.5% for the years 20 through 22. The 2.5% is a decrease from the October budget uh, when it was at 3% for all years due to the state not meeting the revenue projections and the uncertainty of what the funding model may look like once we have a new governor in the fall. Restricted grants and aids are a very small portion of our per pupil funding for economic disadvantaged students and for career technical education. The increase from October is due to the increase in the students participating in qualifying career technical classes, which include our career centers and some of our pathway classes. Other revenue, so we have other operating revenues and other financing revenues sources and other operating revenues are forecasted at 10.4 million now for the May forecast and other financing at 1.3 million for the forecast, uh, yeah. And so we had significant increases in both of these items um, and we'll talk about those. 
So all other operating revenues is about 5.1% of the district's revenue. This line item includes payments in lieu of property taxes, also known as TIFs, uh, tuition paid by other districts, special needs reimbursements, preschool and all-day kindergarten tuition, building rental, investment income, and school fees. The increase from the October forecast relates to special needs tuition paid from other districts of about a million dollars, increase in investment income of about half a million dollars, and increase in reimbursements for special needs catastrophic cost of about 450000 um, that is primarily due to having more students able to be submit for the reimbursement. There is a threshold on if your expenditures go over that when you can submit for that. So we had quite an increase in the number of students that we are submitting this spring. Other financing sources, this category represents the refund of prior year expen expenditures. Some of these occur each year as the reimbursement from Medicaid and our rebate from Staples. Others are not annual, they are just refunds that we get from time to time, either from SERS, Bureau of Workers' Comp, or E-Rate, which is a federal program where we can get reimbursed for some communication purchases. They have to be specific purchases, and then sometimes when we make those, we can get money back. So the big change from October was um, we did receive an E-Rate reimbursement this year. It's a one-time thing that was $546,000 and we received refunds from the Bureau of Workers' Comp of about $408,000. The Bureau of Workers' Comp has already announced that they are gonna give another billion back for I think the fourth time now. Um, and so we will be seeing some of that in July. So you'll see FY19 projections are a little bit higher and then the other years will fall back off because we won't know if we will be getting these one-time things. So that's the revenue. So here's our revenue in a pie chart. You can see that the real estate tax makes up about 60% of the revenue that we receive um, from all our various sources. So for expenditures, um, our first one is personnel services, um, budgeted or forecasted now for May at about $93.8 million. Um, that's a decrease of about $2 million from the October forecast. Uh, personnel services make up about 56.4% of the district's budget. The district was able to contain salary growth in FY18 due to retirement replacement savings. This FY18 was the first full year of the savings of approximately 160 staff that we had leave in the last two years. Um, however, an offset to that is when you bring in staff at a lower level, um, then you have more staff, a higher percentage of staff getting steps as well. So it does have some uh, offset. So the forecast provides an average annual budget increase of 5.8% through FY22. This budget level will help support competitive employee salaries and limited FTE growth. The decision regarding the forecasted budget amounts will be reviewed annually in light of sustainability and levy considerations. Next, we have employee retirement and insurance benefits, forecasted at $32.5 million, a decrease of about $646,000 from the October forecast. So the fringe benefits are about 19.2% of the budget. The change from October is obviously the result of the decreased personnel expenditures, as some of those directly relate, <coughs> and also a partial year increase in premiums for health care. Um, there was originally budgeted the whole amount, but we only we don't change and increase that until December. So five months were at the old rate and then seven at the new. So that was a little bit of that fluctuation as well. Growth in this category is fueled by projected annual increase in health insurance premiums as a result of increased claims. Premiums have been forecasted at 12% for FY19 and 10% thereafter. This is a change from the October forecast when there was 8% increases projected for all years. Each year, the forecast, the district will review actual results with projected and make adjustments as warranted. Purchase services. Purchase services are budgeted at about 22 million. This is an increase of about 700,000 uh, from the October forecast. Tuition paid by others is nearly 51% of the district's purchase services cost. Other costs in this category include utilities, special needs transportation, and legal fees. Tuition costs are very difficult to project because of the volatility of the number of students serve, the level of services, and the service provider. These costs are projected to grow 768,000 in FY19. 
there has been a decrease in the purchase services for FY19 due to reclassing um, some special needs transportation costs to other objects as a large portion of this program will now be brought in-house and those staff will be through uh, the Educational Service Center next year. So you'll see a decrease here in purchase services and then we'll see an increase later when we get to other objects. Supplies and materials are budgeted at just around $6 million and there's no change from the October forecast. The district <laughs> increased uh, its FY16 investment in supplies, primarily instructional, by about a million and a half in FY16. The textbooks and instructional materials for FY18 is projected to be 2.8 million and to drop to 2 million in FY19. This is due to a reclassification of instructional devices. So it's just um, basically our Chromebooks and our other technology devices had been classified in this category with some of them in the capital that you'll see here in just a minute. And so we're just putting them all together in one place so we can track all of those going forward. The rest of the supply account is attributed to custodians, transportation, and buildings. All supplies combined are projected to reduce at an average annual rate of 1.35 percent due to this reclassification. So as I just mentioned, capital outlay is budgeted at just about $2 million for FY18, a slight decrease from October. Uh, capital outlay uh, in the years 15 through 17 included some expenditures for building repairs. The main components of this going forward for FY18 and beyond will be equipment and technology. In addition, as mentioned in the previous slide, the shift of instructional devices from supplies to capital in FY19 is influencing that increase. So pretty much just an offset between the two. Other objects um, are budgeted at, for FY18 at $10.4 million, um, a or an increase of about 300,000 since the October forecast. This category, the primary ob um, expense in this category is contracts with the ESC of about $7.6 million in FY18. This includes our substitutes and our instructional aids. The other operating expenditures include county fees of about $1.5 million for FY18, um, which we pay uh, for the collection of property taxes we pay to the um, treasurer and auditor's office, and then the one-win agreement payment. The increase in FY19 reflects the change, as I mentioned earlier, in the special needs transportation um, with those uh, drivers now becoming uh, employees through the EFC. We'll hire them through the ESC to do that special needs transportation um, that is currently outsourced right now. And then that's partly offset by the decrease in the win-win payment as that continues to phase out over the next four years. Operating transfers out are budgeted at 115,000. There's no change from the October forecast. Uh, just a reminder, those funds are transferred to the 009 fund to offset um, the instructional fees that have to be waived um, for free and reduced lunch children that we can't charge for. And then also the district transfers 65,000 to the 003 fund, the field turf replacement, which that what has built been built up till this point will now be used for the replacement of Central's turf this summer. Uh, replacement of North and South are still a few years out and that will be come from other future transfers and or the permanent improvement fund. So here are our expenditures in a pie chart form. Um, if you can, let me explain. So school districts generally have salary and benefits expenditures that range from 80 to 85 percent. That's your normal where most districts fall. Um, if you look at our salaries and benefits, is 76%, but you also have to add in in that other expense category of 6%, about 5% of that is for our subs and instructional aids. So when you add that in, the district's about 81% for salary and benefits. So here's all that put together in one slide. It's a little bigger, so hopefully you can see. So in summary, the district has performed better than the October forecast in revenues and expenditures. FY18 revenues are up by 5.8 million or 3.26%, primarily due to the timing of real estate payments, tuition from other districts, investment income, and then the E-rate and Bureau Workers' Comp reimbursements. FY18 expenditures are down by about $1.9 million or 1.14% due, due to the containment of salaries and benefits through the retirement and replacement savings. So combined, 
That's a change of $7.7 .7 million, an improvement to the forecast, or about 4.6% of expenditures. And then there's the forecast with the all years on there, just summary level of revenue expenditures. Um, so while the forecast has improved, the re results still point to a revenue, revenue shortfall at beginning in FY20. Projected revenue growth is forecasted at 1.4% through FY22 as compared to projected expenditure growth of 4.81% through FY22. So while cash reserves are strong, <coughs> The district will continue to need to investigate levy scenarios that could provide additional operating revenue at some point in the future. Any questions? Any questions? Very thorough, Laura. Thank you. You're well welcome. done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, right. Laura. Thank you. Can you please call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Burt? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Okay, moving on to agenda item 7.03. Uh, can I please have a motion to amend the fiscal year 2018 appropriations for all funds? So moved. Second. Ms. Hendricks? Yes. So along with the changes that we've made in the forecast, we're also just updating our appropriations, which is a separate document from the forecast. It's what we're using to actually function for this year, our approval level. And because of some of the salary and benefits um, savings that we've had, we're able to reduce some of that. As well, there are some new grants that we've received throughout the year and some other minor funding increases or decreases in our grants. And the other one I wanted to point out was we are increasing the capital improvements PI fund by $300,000 so we can continue to work on the south renovation design that you have asked for. Questions? No. Please call the roll. Okay. Mr. Bird? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Ms. Davidson? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Okay, moving on to agenda item 7.04. Uh, can I please have a motion to approve resolution to approve the application for one-time records disposal? So moved. Second. Ms. Hendricks? Yes, so this is our annual um, records disposal process. We follow the board policy and the administrative guidelines once a year. We um, ask all the staff to go through their records according to that schedule. Um, every record has a time period that it has to be kept and how long. And uh, so once a year we go through and they are able to <laughs> purge some of their records and box those up. And so then we bring this to your, for your approval and then we'll pass the list on to the Ohio Historical Society who reviews it to make sure there's nothing of importance they think they wanna keep. And then we'll go ahead and have those records shredded probably in June time period, so. Any questions? You know, with the retirements and parties and uh, s'mores, I would think that that yeah, size bonfire. bonfire would. <laughs> we gotta run out for bonfires. Bonfire, never mind. <laughs> Clearly, nobody's buying them. <laughs> Can you please call the roll? Yes. Mr. Villardo? <laughs> yes. Ms. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Um, we can do it. the consent calendar up. And then I told Laura I'd ask for a motion, so she's prepped. Okay. Um, our next uh, agenda items are 8.01 through 8.09. I'd like to entertain a motion. So moved. Second. And Madam President, I would like to um, move that we call 8.02 and 8.10 um, separately from the personnel consent agenda. We can call those together. Um, that allows me to vote on the others and to abstain from those that I need to abstain. Okay, so you're modifying the motion? Mm -hmm. Okay. 8.01, 8.03, 8.04, 8.05 through 8.09 for now. I second that motion. Ms. Lofton. Good evening, President Cotter. If it's okay with you, I usually read them all and then you vote 
two separate That's fine. fine. Thank you. Uh, good evening, President Cotter, members of the board. Tonight's consent agenda contains 10 sections involving 550 persons. Over, sorry, 550 persons. Section 8.01 is the resignation of eight classified employees and one substitute. 8.02 is the resignation of four teachers, two supplemental contracts, and one amended item. 8.03 is a contractual status change for five classified employees. 8.04 is a leave of absence for one teacher. 8.05 is a temporary change of assignment for one classified employee. 8.06 is a variety of one-time payments for teachers. 8.07 is the reemployment of three classified administrators. 8.08 8 is the reemployment of 13 licensed administrators and 328 teachers. 8.09 is the employment of two classified employees, two substitutes, and one summer student worker. And 8.10 is the employment of five licensed administrators, four teachers, various extended days, home instruction, tutors, and supplemental contracts. And if I might add, we do have four of our five administrators here with us this evening, so we'd love to introduce those if you want to do that before yes, or after please. your vote. We have uh, Ms. Kaylee Baker, who is our current EdTech uh, integration coach, one of our EdTech integration coaches, is going to be our coordinator of gifted education. Ms. Tammy <laughs> Hanby is currently a counselor at South High School, is going to be our assistant principal, one of our assistant principals at South. Mr. Will Ragland, currently a Bright Fellow intern at, at South High School, is going to be our one of our assistant principals at North High School. And Dr. Paul Hopkins, currently with Patel for Kids, who will be joining us, you, as our new Executive Director of Human Resources. So I'd like to welcome all of them to the Westerville family. Thank you. Um, call the roll on the first can part. you please call the roll on that okay, on motion? The, on eight point, okay. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Ms. Cotter. Yes. Motion and second number. Okay. And can I have a, a motion and a second for items 8.02 and 8.10? So moved. Second. Can you please call the roll? Mr. Villardo? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Abstain. Ms. Davidson? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Um, I would just like to thank you, uh, Ms. Lofton. I know this is your last meeting with us, right? It is. Congratulations. We, yeah. we wish you well on your new opportunity. Um, it's glad that we were able to find someone to take on your role, but we really appreciate all, all you've done for our district and wish you well. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed my time so much at Westerville and really will miss everyone here a great deal. So okay. thank you. Thanks. That's what, yes, she forgot to say. Okay, um, moving on in the agenda, we're on 9.01. I see that there is no old business. Um, and then we have um, new business, item 10.01, policy 7542. Is there anyone you going to talk Mr. about? Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis, would you like to address the board? Um, can I have a, no, I don't need a motion now. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, uh, I have before you two new policies for your consideration. Uh, the first one is 7542, which is access to technology resources, and 7530.02, which is staff use of personal communication. Uh, the first one, uh, 7542, is a policy addressing individuals using personal communication devices. This would be phones, tablets, laptops, anything that they would bring in of their own. Uh, it creates a new policy that governs the use of personal communication devices to access the district's wireless, both the business and the guest. Uh, it also, anyone trying to connect a network device to our infrastructure with a network cable is now required to go through the IT department to verify that it meets criteria, viruses, malwares, or anything that tracks in. It also specifies that any violation of standards may result in the loss of access to the network and involving vendor and potential loss of business and cancellation if we find anybody violating those. The second policy, 7530.02, um, three, sorry, is a policy that addresses 
WCS staff members using personal communication devices while working. The first one addresses safety concerns. The policy addresses the, the safety concerns that prohibits employees from using personal communication devices while driving board-owned devices. It also reinforces the need to maintain confidentiality of student personal identification information and urges discretion if using such devices. It also reinforces that the communication occurring on personal communication devices is subject to public record request. It also requires employees at the conclusion of their employee to verify that any work-related information is actually transferred back to the district. It does require any employees if disposing of or no longer using of personal communication devices to transfer any records also to us. It requires employees to notify the district immediately if their personal communication device is lost or stolen, hacked or anything like that, so that we can actually take a look at it and make sure that none of our information has been compromised. Um, it does prohibit storage of certain information. We wanna make sure that social security numbers, um, personal information, financial information, health records are not stored on personal communication devices. Um, this also notes the excessive use of personal personal devices in the, in the workplace is also identified in here so that we may do uh, results in disciplinary actions on those. Questions? Greg, you may want to uh, check the policy numbers. Mm -hmm. In one, it is 7530.02, uh, and the other one, it's 7530.03. Looks like it's 02. You're correct. Just, yeah, yeah just, oh, oh, okay. just correct I got whichever. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Nancy, do you have some? You could tell since I had my mouth hanging open. Right? I, I just, because you know I'm going to jump on it, and that is. Uh, you go ahead. Yeah, I mean it's just an observation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when Neola um, understands the difference between a policy and yes. an operating procedure. Yes. Yes. Um, and and I have to admit, I mean again, you know, uh, this is the, these two policies are areas of my work expertise. Mm -hmm. What I get concerned about when a policy by Neola is written, written in such a prescriptive manner is that if any of the components within this overly written policy is ever found to be defective, the entire policy will be ruled defective. Right. Um, and, and that's extremely problematic, um, especially when we're talking about personal use and, and business use relative to what the expectations and the demands are on the user. So I, I get concerned as I, I scroll through this, I, I, see, I see the potential for smart people with bad intentions to navigate the loopholes in these prescriptive policies because they're truly procedure documents. And I don't see definitive statements relative to the policies themselves in terms of what is and is not acceptable. Um, I see lots and lots and lots of instructions. So um, we've said this for a number of years. I don't expect it to change. I just uh, feel like we need to exhibit a bit of caution on how much of Neola's guidance we consume for these policies. Mm -hmm. Richard and I take turns on which one of us is going to say something like that. But as I was looking at this one, I was wondering what everybody else thought about maybe this policy, because it is so highly prescriptive, uh, because it is so much administrative guideline oriented, I'm wondering if this might be a good opportunity for us to take the intent of what's brought forward now and rework it into a policy statement and an administrative guideline statement so that we have more of what uh, makes better sense for policy and procedure instead of trying to create a highly prescriptive instruction laden document that isn't really policy and isn't quite the procedures we specifically want to say but is some sort of mishmash of the two so bringing it forward is a good idea as it lets us know, you know what, what are the parameters, what are we looking at, what are the issues that we're facing, but this may be an opportunity for us to um, step out and say, okay, fine, we know that we have problems with this. This one is one that readily lends itself to our taking it apart and making it both policy and guideline statements. I don't know how everybody else feels about that, but uh, we, we could work on that. I like that idea as a test. 
um, because we we continually uh, get frustrated with uh, Neola's wording sometimes, and so maybe maybe this would be the test case where we we split the two. I'd be okay with that. And I think that's something we can do. I think both Greg Lewis and the Gregs and Greg Vibrance both. Um, if they can take a look at that and maybe Richard obviously because of your background with technology and Nancy with the, the policy we can send something out to you guys before we bring it back for a second reading I'm game yeah yeah I and, and I'll just give a quick highlight on the very last uh, line related to potential disciplinary action mm -hmm. a violation of this policy may constitute just cause for disciplinary action up to and including termination Use of a PCD in any manner contrary to local, state, or federal laws may result in disciplinary action up to and including termination. That, that's, that's great from a general statements uh, standpoint, but if we take into account just the federal laws component of that, exactly which federal laws are we, you know, suggesting, you know, qualify for disciplinary action and termination? Are we talking about, you know, participating in um, either knowingly or unknowingly, you know, uh, actions by nation state actors or by terrorist organizations or being duped by, you know, there's just, um, there's just a lot of um, air gap in, in the way that this is written that, like I said, creates opportunities either for people to get caught up in situations that they're completely unaware of and, and can't necessarily manage or folks that are technologically savvy can navigate through these loopholes. So I think we need to do some work on this. Okay. Yeah, well, thank thank you. you, Mr. Lewis. Moving on to agenda item 11.01, .01, standing business approval of the class of 2018 graduates from Central North and South High Schools. Uh, just a little information. Um, well, first, can I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, I do have some details here. We have, for Westville South High School, we have 426 graduates this year. Um, Central High School has 466, and North has 427. Any other comments? Um, I just think it would be an awesome prank. Am I actually allowed to exclude one student? <laughs> I mean, let's do three. Do three? Yeah. yeah. I mean, just like one last oh, shot. Four. No, okay, there we go. So moved. <laughs> we can keep it at home. I think that was just a joke. Um, any other comments? Not that yeah. I should make. Okay. No. Uh, can you please call the roll? Mrs. Davidson. Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes. Mr. Bird. Yes. Mr. Villardo. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Cotter. Yes. Okay, moving on to agenda item 11.02. Um, can I please have a motion and a second to approve donations? So moved. Second. I would just like to say thank you. Uh, we always appreciate donations. We have a lot of very uh, generous entities that support the district on a regular basis. So can you please call the roll? Mr. Villardo. Yes. Mr. Bird. Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes. Mrs. Davidson. Yes. Ms. Cotter. Yes. Okay. Moving on to agenda item 11.03, our overnight field trips. Um, can I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Comments um, or questions? I, I just want to say one thing, and I and I wish I didn't have to say this, but uh, those that have observed the news in the last few weeks have seen um, school trips and accidents and uh, sadness. And so at this point in the agenda, we always make a joke about, oh, take us, take us. I mean, we, we laugh about it. and. We send the kids with our blessing and all of that, and uh, I, I, um, I, I think I just want to say to folks that we as a board uh, are thrilled that they do this kind of thing, um, but there's a part of us that is quite well aware that these are kids, um, they're students, 
and uh, we're placing them in the hands of uh, responsible adults. And uh, we have complete confidence, but I just in watching the news the last couple of weeks, I thought I, I, we need to say that we, we, we do recognize this, parents and teachers, that this is, these are precious lives. That's, really, just wanted to say that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Can you please call the roll? Mr. Bird? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Okay, moving on to agenda item 11.04. Um, can I please have a motion and a second to approve the resolution to employ the treasurer? So moved. Second. Okay, uh, I would like to introduce our treasurer candidate and her family. If you wouldn't mind staying up, Nicole Marshall. She's here with her family, her daughter Alyssa, and her husband Jason. She comes to us with a variety of experience. Uh, she's a treasurer in Fairborn City Schools. <clears throat> she's also been the assistant treasurer in Kettering uh, City Schools, and then um, she's also been an auditor for the state auditor's office. So I think she's going to do a fabulous job here in Westerville. We're really excited to have her. She's planning on moving here too, so definitely going to be an important part of the community. Um, okay, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Can you please call the roll? Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. Welcome. Okay, moving on the agenda is um, item 12.01. We do have some speakers. Just a reminder that you'll each have five minutes to address the board. Um, and um, our first speaker, if you come up to the podium, is Sean Urbanic. Urbanic? <laughs> Urbanic. Okay. Um, the timer will be on the screen. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Yeah, give me a poke when we get to about four minutes, <laughs> if we're still here. <laughs> um, so, first of all, um, um, I want to thank you. Um, for your service to the community, board members. Um, as, a, as proud parents of a graduating senior who is presumably still on the list of, <laughs> of graduates approved this evening, um, we very much appreciate the quality of the education and the support services that she's received um, from grades one through 12. And we're very proud of her for her hard work, but very appreciative of, of everything that went into getting her to where she is today. Um, we do, however, think there's, there's, you know, as always, a little bit of room for opportunity um, for, for improvement. Um, you may recall we've been here before um, to ask for some support with regard to communication around changes to food service menus. Um, our daughter, Lila, um, as well as our graduating senior, both have pretty significant food allergies. Lila's are um, uh, fairly lengthy uh, and, and really considerably restrict the diet uh, and the days that she can eat at school. Um, so, you know, we're very actively uh, seeking information about the menus, um, uh, but uh, menus change, and we understand there are circumstances where, where that's a necessity, uh, but we asked for, for support with, um, with a method by which parents could be notified of menu changes. Um, and, and we appreciate the, uh, the direction you gave us. We were able to, uh, to make contact with food services. Um, Ms. Uh, is it Carissa? Yeah, Miss Carissa Dennis, um, who is currently out on leave, um, was very responsive ultimately in helping us develop an exception process by which we would we would get communications, and that was initially very effective. Um, unfortunately, it was an exception process, um, limited in scope um, and subject to the kind of deterioration you would ex expect of an exception process. People change positions, um, exception processes that aren't exercised are forgotten. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, we had a couple of instances that, uh, of that coming up here at the end of the year. Um, one instance where uh, there was a, uh, a communication that was made inside the school um, of an upcoming menu change for the next day. Uh, but unfortunately, our daughter didn't let us know about it until 
the day of on the way to school, um, which is exactly the, the challenge that we saw in, in that method of communication, relying on a, um, an underage student to convey important information can be hit or miss despite <laughs> how good she is and how smart she can be sometimes, amazingly so. Um, more recently, just last Friday, there was a menu change. Um, after we sought an understanding of, of what the menu was going to be for these last couple of days of the year, recognizing that things get a little bit um, ad hoc, uh, we very proactively sought information about the, the menu for the last couple of days. Um, we received it. We received information. We, um, we actually were present during a confirmation uh, that the, uh, the contents of the meeting for, of, the, of the menu on Friday would be um, all safe ingredients, at least one item. Uh, but when Lila got to school, um, she got to the lunch line, that one safe item wasn't available. So if I may, I'd like to let you, um, I'd like my daughter to tell you what she had for lunch that day, if, if that's permissible. Lila, would you mind telling them what you had for, for lunch on Friday? Mm -hmm. Here. Just speak up into it, it, it'll be fine. Tell me what you had. Two milks, one cranberry packet, some goldfish, and applesauce. So, you know, we appreciate the, the responsivity of food services. When Lila pointed out that there wasn't a safe menu item there for her, they, they didn't push back, they didn't argue with her, they didn't try to force an item on her, um, and they did provide her something, which we appreciate. Um, we think there was probably a lot of opportunity there, though, in that they could have contacted us, and they probably could have found a little bit more um, for, for, for choices. Um, so with that as an example, we would like you to, to consider, and the reason that we're here tonight, is we'd like you to consider a, a broader, more comprehensive approach to communication of menu changes, something that I, I don't think, and, you know, Mr. Bird, you probably know the cost of, of these kinds of communications much better than I do. Um, but, you know, we think that they're, given the infrastructure that exists for communication to parents, there's, there's got to be a more effective way, more reliable way, where menu changes can be communicated. And we recognize um, that, that this opportunity is far, far broader than a single family at a single school. Um, and I'm sure you're aware as well. So, you know, if we can contribute to that conversation at all, we would be more than glad to, but please consider something more durable than, than what was put in place for us when we were here last. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have one other speaker, Jen Hubble. Would you like to come up to the podium? Hello, all of you. Um, I would like to be much less formal than this, but this is my opportunity, so, um, and excuse me, it was field day today and I haven't been home yet, so. Um, I'm here just because usually when I come to speak at a board meeting, I'm here not only as a, I'm here tonight not only as a parent, but also as a staff member and I'm a teacher at Walnut Springs Middle School, uh, seventh and eighth grade math, but I usually come here not only to represent or talk to you about my own children, but as a representative for those children who don't necessarily have parents who have the time or energy or you know just to to realize um that their child may be impacted by something and so um this year i have a my daughter's a seventh grader at genoa and as i said i teach at walnut springs and it, my seventh grader is experiencing a much different middle school experience than my uh, son who is, will be a senior next year in that there are a lot of courses offered at the middle school level now that are high school uh credit classes and that's wonderful no complaints my worry is for these students um, we're, we're talking about two sets of students and I sent an email out to all of you and Dr. Kellogg was great and he responded and it was great but I just feel like email doesn't always communicate really what my goal is and um, I, I know that he said you will look at that policy and I, I was surprised to find that other districts treat the, these courses and the way it impacts a child's high school GPA very differently than ours does and that surprised me. My, my main concern is that these are kids who are not as mature and aren't and even though they'll say you know I, I, I'm gonna do this and they don't necessarily always know how that can impact them in, in their future and they also um, they want to challenge themselves and, and I don't want to see these students 
have a negative impact from wanting to have that academic challenge. So we have students who now can take Algebra 1, they can take Spanish, and now they can take, in all the middle schools, now they can take the honors um, history. It's a lot. And then many of these students are then taking advanced classes in other subject areas. And so yes, as a parent, we can say, no, we don't, we don't want them to do that. But why are we telling them no for something they're trying to do to challenge themselves? And my worry is that there, it's very hard, as you all know, that it's very hard to bring a GP up, GPA up. It's very easy to make your GPA go down. And so I would hate to have these students who are trying to challenge themselves start off high school with the challenge of having to, to climb that mountain. And so I think we have to be careful just because we're, we're giving them all these wonderful opportunities, but are they really mature enough yet to understand the impact that that can have on them in high school? And the, the thing that really it came to me last week after I got Dr. Kellogg's response, and it was great, and he said he, he, and he copied Mr. Reeves, and he said we're going to address the policy moving forward, but he can't really see a change. These students have 10 days to decide if they want to continue with these courses. 10 days, you're asking me as a parent to decide if my daughter can handle that course load. I think that we probably can find a way to make a change, at least in that, in that time frame. Give us an opportunity to let them really try. Ten days doesn't let them try. And so I'm here tonight just to say, I'm not asking you to revamp this whole policy or say that it doesn't have to impact their GPA like other school districts, but maybe you can give us a little more time to say, hey, look, this is, we're glad you tried this. We're proud of you for trying this, but maybe you need to maybe we need to take take a step back from all this without just right away saying don't try and then the thing that really came to mind was for my students so I teach seventh and eighth grade math um, common core and this year the district is offering for the first time a course that we're calling bridge that allows these students who um, haven't been in the accelerated math courses to now take a bridge course for the first half of the semester of school along simultaneously with algebra one high school credit class affecting their GPA. Um, as I recommended or I talked to parents on the phone for the students that we want to offer this to, I tried to express to them how this can impact them, but I'm not sure they all get it, especially if they haven't had a high school student. And so I'm really concerned for those students who are taking, they want to, they're, they're all excited about this opportunity to do this. But I have, I, I'm just worried that I'm, I'm setting them up for an opportunity at failure instead of success, instead of rewarding them for their hard work. So I just hope that you can think about that time frame and give them a chance to be successful and not be punished right, right just because they didn't, you know, didn't, they took on something that they wanted to challenge themselves and then they maybe didn't, Five it was minutes. too much. Okay, so just the time frame. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs> Okay, um, moving on to agenda item 13.01. Are there any board comments? Uh, just a couple things. I do think that uh, we can look at a more comprehensive approach to letting parents know about menu changes. I think that uh, we do have the technology and platforms that are available to make that work. Um, probably it's exactly as Mr. Urbanic was talking about people who were engaged in doing that may have moved on or, or on leave or whatever but i think that we can find a way to implement that not only implement but embed it so that it does does happen well um, you know whether we're using power school or whatever else we can use to uh, get word out about that the function is more in embedding the process so that it does happen because you're right there are a number of children that this does apply to and those children will continue to enter our doors and need our help with that so hopefully we can take a look at that mark if you pass that along and work on that I would would very much appreciate that the second thing Jen your email was was very clear I understood the problem immediately uh, when uh, you laid it out I was also pleased with Dr. Kellogg's response um, He's very much interested in looking at that, and Mr. Reeves is taking that on. I am very much interested in a rapid return on the information 
on finding out what solutions we may need to implement. Because you're right, we've made a number of changes, we've opened up a whole lot of doors, and you have to be careful when you open those doors as regards the ramifications of stepping through them. So uh, I appreciate you bringing that forward, and I understand the timeline need. So hopefully we will be able to look at that sooner rather than later. Any other comments? Yeah, I, um, uh, first of all, uh, Nicole and, and your family, so glad to have you here. Very excited to have, uh, have you stepping into this new role with us. Um, it, unfortunately, you have to put up with the school board, so just fair warning. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I do, I, I do want to kind of come back to the five-year forecast. Um, I, I kind of hesitated to uh, open up uh, comments during, during the presentation, but um, one of the things that, that I see when we look at our five-year forecast, and we have used this as our measuring stick um, uh, with a lot of discipline over the last several years, um, the, the things that concern me within the five-year forecast um, are those things that we have the least control over. Um, most uh, obviously within the revenues, or pardon me, the expenditure space is, is uh, insurance costs. Um, the, when we see insurance costs that we're having to forecast at 10 and 12 percent uh, growth year on year, that is tracking at multiple times the rates of inflation, um, which tends to be our guidepost relative to the growth of, of expenditures. Um, and, and when you look at that seven or eight year pathway of 10 and 12 percent growth per year, we start to see um, substantial changes in the amount of money required uh, to, to support those benefits for, um, for our staff, our teachers, and, our, uh, and their families. Um, it, this isn't our problem. This is everybody's problem, obviously. But uh, it does concern me. And I think um, probably even more importantly, uh, what does concern me is, um, and, and I've been very, very blunt about this in the past, and I felt it was necessary to kind of be blunt about it again, um, it, there is the tremendous amount of uncertainty relative to our four-time found unconstitutional school funding model in the state of Ohio, um, a, a state school funding model that has been refused to be touched by multiple legislatures. Um, nobody uh, from the governor's office to uh, the House of Representatives, the, uh, the State House and the State Senate has had the uh, ability to exhibit any courage in actually taking on this problem. And it results in a substantial cap of funds that our citizens pay in taxes that are not returned to this district. And uh, on top of that, this district is recognized as a district where the community gives more than its fair share relative to uh, the revenues that we generate locally. So the state takes away and our community steps up and we continue to see this over and over and over again with no resolution because we have people at the state level of government that exhibit no courage in fixing a problem that the Supreme Court has told them to fix multiple times. That's what concerns me about our five-year forecast all the good things that we have been doing continue to have an element of risk relative to the actions of others and the inactions of others. And it's my hope that one day, at least within my lifetime, that we see uh, a state that takes on accountability and responsibility for fixing this mess. Any other comments? How long do you plan to live? I was thinking, yes. Uh, 107. I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bird. I agree with Dr. Nestor Baker. Uh, the comments uh, really, it's was, it was wonderful emails. I love receiving emails that challenge us um, with uh, some some changes that uh, we can try to tackle. And uh, thank you, Jen, for that. And to the Urbanic family, thank you for coming forward again. And let's just uh, keep pursuing this. I think it's important. And surely we can do a better job in communicating that. So uh, that's important. Uh, retirement recognition, really, the folks, and I, I know none of them stayed for the board meeting. I don't know why, but none of them stayed. And so 
they're out that door, but we really do celebrate all they've given. Uh, if you want to see some fun graduations, join us uh, this Saturday down at Celeste Center. Uh, ten is south, right? Two is uh, <laughs> north, right? And uh, six then central. So really, come on down. It's just really, it's wonderful to see the joy in these kids' faces and in the parents and, and the teachers and just uh, it's just a wonderful celebration that, that we get to be a part of, but, but you all accomplished. We just get to be a part of it. Um, I, too, would like to, Nicole, welcome, and uh, Elise, right? Am I, Alyssa. Alyssa. <laughs> Alyssa, uh, Alyssa I, 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 I'm excited to have you here. And if you do not get a piece of cake like you were promised, I want you to tell me afterwards, all right? We'll, we'll talk about this. Yeah, I'm getting everybody in trouble now, aren't I? Uh, welcome aboard. Excited to have all of you here with us. Um, and I want to say a big thank you to uh, the lady to my left here. Um, uh, Laura has stepped in uh, with the unfortunate departure of Bart, who led us extremely well some of these numbers and and where we are today is due to a lot of work that he had done for a number of years and laura stepped right in and kept it going and and has done very well and so i really i think from all of us we are very grateful for the work that you've done it and and you're continuing and you're going on so but yeah, she's uh, i just not, she's not gonna <laughs> stop right now she's 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 thinking about it she yeah uh, okay all right um and the final thing i want to give a word from the board and administration to uh, uh miss rhonda gilpin Rhonda is the head of uh, uh, the Teachers Union, WEA, and her brother, who has been uh, quite ill, uh, passed away today. And so we, uh, f on, on, certainly on your behalf, um, send Rhonda our, our thoughts and our prayers. And uh, uh, she, is a, she is a good lady uh, with a broken heart right now. And so we just uh, wanted to share um, our thoughts on certainly our condolences um, to Rhonda. Thank you. Okay, um, I would like to echo my welcome to Nicole and her family again. Um, thanks also for Ms. Hendricks for doing a great job as our interim treasurer. Um, and then um, I also want to welcome all the other administrators that are starting. I know most of them have left with their families, but I do want to welcome them as well. Okay, moving on to uh, agenda item 14.01. The board will meet in regular session on Monday, June 11th and Monday, June 25th at 6 p.m. here at the Early Learning Center. Um, and then I would like to um, entertain a motion and a second for adjournment. Second. So, <laughs> so moved and second. So moved and second. Pick who you like, Laura. Uh, yeah, wherever. Can you please call the roll? Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes. Mr. Villardo. Yes. Mr. Bird. Yes. Ms. Davidson. Ms. Cotter. Yes. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you so much for attending this evening.